good day so today uh, we will talk about some uh, uh, some protocols which are useful for uh, controlling the network and uh, for the making machines connected to the network uh, specifically under the broad class we will talk about uh, dhcp and icmp <coughs> so we, uh, and uh, there are some protocols associated with this so we will talk about those so dhcp is dynamic host configuration protocol okay so it is about configuring a host configuring a machine configuring a maybe a pc or a, uh, or some computer which is connected to the uh, network <coughs> chief utility uh, i mean well there are other utilities of dhcp we will come to that later but then its chief uh, motivation came from dynamic assignment of ip addresses now dynamic assignment of ip addresses is desirable for several reasons uh, first of all uh, ip addresses can be assigned on demand okay uh, this may be good uh, for example, when you have a um, uh, scarcity of IP addresses, uh, say real IP addresses, in that case, uh, it may be um, n uh, nice that, uh, I mean, for people, uh, you keep a central pool of uh, IP addresses <coughs> and then as some, <coughs> sorry, as some uh, computer comes online, it assigns an uh, IP address from the pool and uh, when it goes out, naturally that IP address is uh, withdrawn and given maybe to some other machine. Okay. Uh, so, that is uh, one good thing about it. Another uh, place where it may be required is that suppose you have uh, some kind of what is known as a RAS or a remote access server to which uh, a number of um, machines would connect via dial up uh, connection. So, in that case you want to give them a uh, temporary IP address for the duration of the connection. Then uh, uh, suppose somebody is visiting some network uh, 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 with a laptop okay, and the laptop he wants to connect. Now, he has to get a network address of that particular network. So, that network address has to be dynamically assigned. So, IP addresses are assigned on demand. This of course, also avoids manual IP configuration which is prone to errors and support mobility of laptop. Now, uh, three protocols have been used for this one after the other uh, and uh, they have overlapped. Okay. So, RARP which is major use up to 1985 beyond that also people kept on using it and then boot P and which is a bootstrap protocol and then uh, currently the DHCP. All right. So, DHCP uh, for example, this DHCP um, uh, works with a boot P. Uh, so, if, if there is a boot P client also, he can then still use a DHCP server, but only DHCP is widely used today. <coughs> so, so let us quickly look at this RARP and boot P also. So, uh, uh, RARP actually this is reverse ARP. Uh, so, uh, address ARP or address resolution protocol, if you remember uh, that uh, the problem was that given an IP address. Uh, or uh, rather um, given a, a ma this is a for mapping between IP addresses and MAC addresses. So, for ARP is given an IP address, what is the MAC address? This I want to, uh, I have this I need when I want to communicate over a LAN. RARP is the reverse of this that, uh, that what is the, um, uh, that this is the MAC address what is the IP address. Now, why would that be necessary? That would be necessary in case suppose you have something like a diskless workstation which boots over the network. Now, a diskless workstation of course, it has its um, MAC address, its own MAC address. It wants to get assigned an IP address. So, that is an uh, example of where RARP is typically used. So, it broadcasts a request for IP address uh, associated with a given MAC address. So, j this is just like ARP. Uh, RARP server responds with an IP address, only assigns IP address not the defiled router, subnet mask, other things which are required there that, that is not a part of this RARP. So, you have this uh, IP address to MAC address that is ARP and Ethernet MAC address to IP address that is the RARP. 
Next is uh, uh, some uh, improved version of the same thing that means, we want to uh, still assign IP addresses dynamically uh, is the bootstrap protocol, but it uh, does some more things. Okay. So, host can configure IP parameters uh, at boot time. So, basically this is of three services, one is IP address assignment, um, second is detection of IP address for a serving machine and the name of a file to be uh, loaded and executed by the client machine. This is a boot file name. So, that is where uh, from I mean this is the um, uh, source from which it gets its name bootstrap protocol. So, when a machine is booting up, uh, it not only gets an IP address, it also uh, gets the name of a file which can be loaded and executed. So, that is the bootstrap protocol um, uh, or this is also known as boot P. It not only assigns IP address but also default router, network mask, etcetera. So, whatever the um, particular machine requires for communication and uh, namely its network uh, that subnet mask and the gateway etcetera that uh, those addresses are given by the uh, boot P protocol. This is sent as an UDP message. Uh, so, UDP port 67 for server and UDP uh, and port 68 for host. <coughs> this uh, port 68 for host uh, this is uh, required because uh, you may be uh, you may want to uh, from bootstrap protocol you may want to find out about a machine which is already there on the network and use limited broadcast address that is 255 255 255 255 this address if you recall from our discussion about addresses this is a broadcast address where the broadcast is uh, limited to this particular subnet or network. Boot peep can be used for downloading memory image for diskless workstation. So, whatever was uh, the motivation for RARP the same thing can be done through boot P and assignment of IP address to hosts is static. This is uh, one, uh, uh, one sort of uh, drawback of uh, boot Next, uh, I mean to make it dynamic, we go to the dynamic host configuration protocol, which is uh, sort of becoming the st become the standard now. So, which is more versatile than uh, RARP or boot P uh, and it can do a lot of things apart from um, uh, just giving the IP address as we will see. So, this was designed in 1993 an extension of boot P many similarities to boot P and same port numbers as boot P. So, that is why uh, they I mean so if you have some boot P clients uh, that also the DHCP server can handle. Some extensions some important extensions there are a lot of extensions especially with options, but these extensions supports temporary allocation or leases of IP address. Uh, by leasing of IP address, we mean just uh, recall the situation when we have a say a remote access server uh, and where people are dialing up. So, what would happen is that that would be given a particular IP address for a fixed amount of time all right. and when its lease uh, expires that IP address may be withdrawn. So, of course, what would happen is that uh, maybe and we will come to that maybe halfway down the lease period. Uh, if uh, there is uh, no uh, great demand for IP addresses, then the lease may be automatically extended or if there is a great demand, the lease may be withdrawn also. So, this is for a temporary period of time. So, that is how it is dynamic. DHCP client can acquire all IP configuration parameters. So, all types of parameters can be had. I mean, so not only subnet mask and uh, uh, gateway uh, addresses which are also there in boot P, but then there are all, all kinds of other parameters can also be downloaded from uh, uh, DHCP server. So, DHCP is the preferred mechanism for dynamic assignment of IP addresses that is one thing and DHCP can interoperate with uh, boot P clients and it has a number of options. It is not possible to uh, mention all the options here other DHCP information that is sent as an option. So, the number of options is actually greater than 100 number of possible options. So, these include things like subnet mask, network server uh, uh, sorry name server, host name, domain name 
uh, forward on off default IP time to leave broadcast address static route Ethernet encapsulation X window manager X window font DHCP message type DHCP renewal time DHCP rebinding uh, time SMTP <coughs> server SMTP server client uh, FQDN printer name so you see all kinds of uh, I mean as, as a matter of fact as the number of services um, grew over uh, as the number of services which are given over a network as that grew it became uh, important to give a more information to the machines <coughs> I mean uh, originally the machine was just for communicating between two uh, computers but as more and more services for example there may be a centralized print service on the network so whenever you want to print something you fire the print job and it will be done over the network similarly all kinds of other services become became available in the uh, local network as well as over wider network so as more and more services become available it became necessary to give this kind of so all of the all these would require some kind of uh, configuration on the host end because the host end must know what all are there so such information can be transferred uh, via this dhcp that is the main point so dhcp operation there are a number of them i'll mention them uh, but describe only a few say dhcp discover at this time the dhcp client can start to use the ip address so uh, it has uh, discovered it renewing a lease sent when 50 percent of the lease has expired if DHCP server DHCP in act not acknowledge then address is released then the address has to be released then you know that uh, your lease is not going to be uh, uh, renewed DHCP release at this time the DHCP client has released the IP address so client has uh, given it up DHCP message header fields so, so some fields there is an op code so either there is a DHCP request or DHCP that is from the client and DHCP reply from the server so they have op codes 1 and 2 no DHCP message type is sent as in an option um, so uh, what type of message hardware type which is 1 for ethernet hardware address length which is again 6 for ethernet hop count set to 0 by client and uh, transaction id this is an integer used to match reply to response if there are more than one uh, <coughs> requests seconds the number of seconds in since the client started to boot client ip address your ip address server ip address gateway ip address client hardware address server host name boot file name uh, so uh, there are all these fields are there what happens is that when a client uh, sends the request it uh, it would fill in whatever it is uh, whatever is known to him maybe the mac address is known to him so he'll put in the mac address so all and other fields he will leave blank so that is the ma message he will broadcast the dhcp server will pick it up and then fill up all the other uh, necessary um, fields and then uh, broadcast it back so these are all the different uh, DHCP message types like uh, so which is there in the option DHCP discover DHCP offer DHCP request DHCP decline DHCP acknowledge not acknowledge DHCP release DHCP inform and so on okay so having discussed about uh, DHCP our next topic is ICMP internet control message protocol now <coughs> it is necessary because internet is of course based on the internet protocol now IP protocol has some drawbacks uh, one of the uh, main drawbacks is that is the best effort delivery service uh, but it lacks error control and lack of assistant mechanisms okay uh, uh, the point uh, the point is this that uh, since um, this uh, ip is a best effort delivery it's understood that at some point of time the effort may not be enough and 
uh, uh, routers or other nodes on the network may have to drop packets or packets may not reach its destination uh, in time in proper order etc etc that may happen okay but the uh, so so that part is accepted but then if that happens uh, does the um, source get to know because if it uh, first of all there is no error control and secondly if such errors do occur uh, there is no uh, message to the uh, sources okay uh, that, uh, so that is one thing um, so that is a, that, that is a lacuna and secondly uh, th there is a <coughs> you want to control the network for some reason for example maybe the network is getting congested okay so you want to do something about it you want to tell others uh, something about it but ip does not have the mechanism so for all this purpose this icmp was brought in so uh, what happens when something goes wrong what happens if a router must discard a datagram because it cannot find the route to the final destination what if the time to leave field has a zero value what if it has to discard all fragments because not all were received in a predetermined time limit so all the, in all these cases ip has to discard uh, a packet and similarly then there are other um, uh, uh, other situation for example maybe it has reached the destination but the port is not available okay things like that so ip protocol also lacks a mechanism for host and management queries so icmp was designed to compensate for these deficiencies so ipm uh, icmp has a type field its a message type is a type field indicates the type of icmp message being sent and the types we will come to that it may be queries or it may be <coughs> errors uh, code field gives further info uh, information specific to the icmp message so uh, for example for an error what kind of error it is checksum field used to verify the integrity of the icmp data uh, so once again a checksum is included to control the error so these are the as i was saying the type of message there are two types we have the icmp message uh, we have error reporting and we have some query response kind of thing so if there is some error so this kind of ip uh, this type of uh, icmp message would be generated and if there is a query uh, another type of icmp message would be generated so error reporting by the way there is no effort in icmp to correct uh, the errors okay uh, th that is the uh, job of some other uh, some other layer okay so maybe that is uh, taken care of as we will see uh, that that is taken care of when we handle um, uh, tcp okay or maybe some other higher layer uh, protocol but the point is so it does not try to um, correct the errors it merely reports the errors okay and it error messages are sent to the source so whatever be the suppose the datagram has been sent and something has happened to it uh, uh, whatever uh, so so that and that, that, that is because of that some error has occurred so that message so whoever drops that packet he generates an icmp message back to the source so that may be an router on the way that may even be the uh, final destination so these are various types of errors uh, so, so in error reporting let's say there may be destination may be unreachable uh, there is a source quench uh, sending too fast we will see a look a uh, little bit into the details of some of the important ones time exceeded some parameters problem or a redirection so these are uh, basically some of them they are by no means all okay but please note that no icmp error message would be generated in response to a datagram carrying an icmp error message that means uh, that whoever somebody has generated an icmp error message and it is traveling back to the source and, and that itself gets an error that itself may be have to be uh, dropped on the way or something in such cases we do not generate another icmp message okay um, uh, quite a bit of problem uh, happens uh, due to maybe congestion of network so if the network is very congested many packets may get dropped and then if in response to dropping any packet you generate more packets then the congestion is not going to go away 
So, uh, ICMP, so ICMP error messages do not trigger other ICMP error messages. For a fragmented datagram that is not the first seg, uh, fragment. For example, a datagram may have been fragmented into a number of parts, maybe we say maybe 50 parts. Now, for each of them you generate an ICMP message and the ICMP messages would be too many. So, uh, so it is only generated for the first fragment. For a datagram having a multicast address, once again mm, mm, this is uh, I mean we cannot send uh, ICMP messages to all members of the group. Uh, and for a datagram having a special address such as, as this loopback address or some address like that. So, there, so no ICMP error messages are generated for these. So, all error messages contain a data section that includes the IP header of the original datagram plus the first 8 bytes of data in that datagram. This information is required, so the source can inform the protocols about the error. Uh, what would uh, happen is that uh, the from the original packet which was let us say dropped from that the IP header is uh, sent back. So, that you know that uh, first of all you have to know that to which machine which is the source where do you want to send back this ICMP message and secondly even after this ICMP message gets back uh, to the um, specific machine from which the original packet had uh, was. I mean generate was uh, generated. So, at that point uh, this may be uh, this may have be a some error message due to the network intervening network may be the network is too busy or congested or this may have to do something with some uh, process or application which is uh, running on the source machine. So, uh, now uh, so after getting that uh, message it must know uh, to whom to tell that uh, host machine must know that to whom which process this uh, relates to. So, that is why uh, some part the initial part of the original datagram that means the IP header of the original datagram plus the first 8 bytes of data in that datagram. You would understand that uh, after the IP header uh, what comes is the transport layer header. So, the part of the transport layer header also goes into the um, uh, goes back along with the ICMP message. This information is required so that the source can inform the protocols about the error. Now, one um, type of error message is destination unreachable, when a router cannot route a datagram or a host cannot deliver a datagram. In that case the destination is unreachable. A router cannot detect all problems that prevent the delivery of a packet. Uh, so, it is not always possible to exactly know why the uh, destination is unreachable, but at least this information that the destination is unreachable that uh, goes back to the source. Source quench. Uh, so, this is a crude attempt to implement some kind of flow control. IP protocol has got no flow control, routers and hosts have limited size queues. Uh, so, what uh, may happen is that may be in an intermediate router a number of uh, packets have uh, come up suddenly there is a flood of packets into one intermediate router from various directions. So, what it will uh, so what will happen is that its buffer is going to overflow it will not be able to process because there is a limit uh, depending on the speed of the router etcetera there is a limit how fast packets can be processed uh, and forwarded uh, by an intermediate router and uh, if other packets keep coming in within that time they are going to be stored in the buffer. Now, the buffer might overflow in that case there is no other way, but to drop those packets that router cannot do anything. So, that is uh, uh, that is uh, this thing. So, what um, uh, this router desperately wants to tell other uh, people in the network is that uh, please slow down on sending packets, I cannot handle it, I, I am overwhelmed. So, he is basically trying to uh, slow down the um, this thing, uh, so slow down the message, uh, slow down the flow of packets into itself. So, it sends a source quench ICMP message uh, towards the sources. Uh, so, routers and whole, uh, so if datagrams are received faster than they can be processed the queue may overflow. So, in that case it asks uh, the this thing to slow down. If a router or host discards a datagram due to congestion it sends a source quench message to the sender. 
the source must slow down the sending of datagram until the congestion is relieved. This may be used when bottlenecks occur for example, on a WAN link with too much congestion it used to reduce the amount of data lost. Now, warning source quench messages will in turn generate uh, network congestion because uh, there were already too many packets in the network, but you have uh, sent a source quench packet uh, towards the uh, towards the source. So, what is going to happen is that in the router immediately before and that uh, um, um, I mean the in one which is just one hop towards the distance uh, towards the uh, source, he will get uh, he was already getting packets from the source and he will also get an ICMP message from the router uh, just one hop down. So, he is now having more packets. So, this way actually what will happen is that congestion might travel uh, towards the source, but anyway after finally, it reaches the source that source will hopefully slow down and all this will die down. Time exceeded, whenever a router receives a datagram with a time to leave value of 0 that means, it has been uh, going round the network, it discards the datagram and sends a time exceeded message to the source. When the final destination does not receive all of the fragments in a set time, it discards the received fragments and sends a time exceeded message to the source. So, these are two uh, different cases, one, uh, one is that in the, in the destination all the fragments did not reach, some of the fragments never reached. Uh, so, there was a specified time after which it has to drop all the fragments and send a time exceeded message to the original source. And the other thing is that um, when a router uh, receives a datagram with a time to leave field which is 0. By the way, if you remember this uh, keeping a time to leave field and decrementing it at every hop, this is quite important because suppose there were some um, packets which you are sort of floating around in the uh, in the in the network and due to some uh, trouble with the routing tables, the a loop has been formed. So, what is going to happen is that uh, if you do not have this time to leave field, this will go round and round and just uh, keep on ad infinitum in the, so they are going to slowly burden the network. Uh, so, uh, the solution to that was that after a certain number of hops, uh, the um, um, packet is dropped. So, what is done is when the packet is dropped, a message time exceeded message is sent to the source. There may be parameter problems. If an ambiguity is found in the header of a datagram, the datagram is discarded and a parameter problem message is sent back to the source. Redirection. A host usually starts with a small routing table that is gradually augmented and updated. One of the tools to accomplish this is the redirection message. So, this helps in routing actually. Now, let us come to queries. ICMP can also diagnose some network problems. For example, echo request and reply, timestamp, address mask, router solicitation and advertisement. So, these are examples of queries. We will just see a few of these also. Echo request and uh, reply, uh, uh, this is uh, <coughs> used uh, very often when you want to find out whether a network is uh, up and running or not. We will come to this in more detail later on, but here an echo request message can be sent by a host or router. An echo reply message is sent by the host or router which receives an echo request message. The echo request and echo reply message can be used by network managers to check the operation of the IP protocol. Echo request and echo reply message can test the reachability of a host. This is usually done by invoking the ping command. Uh, so, uh, we will uh, go to the more details of ping etcetera trace route uh, later on, because that is one kind of command which even users uh, quite often require. For example, you have logged on and uh, now you find that you cannot reach uh, anybody, the network is not, um, I mean some address that you want to reach, uh, it is not coming at all. So now, now, where is the problem? First of all, maybe you want to find is the problem in your local network, is the problem in the, uh, maybe in the local subnet uh, there is a gateway. So, you might ping that gateway to see whether uh, the, you can reach up to the gateway. If your ping message goes up to the 
um, gateway and then an echo reply comes, then you know that up to that much the network is ok. Then maybe you uh, then for the entire network you want may want to ping the router whether you are ok up to the router. If you are ok up to the router maybe the problem is somewhere uh, in the link outside. I mean the problem may even be in the right in the destination uh, which you are trying to reach. So, one way to keep go on probing the network even by users is to use ping. So, we will see a little bit more about ping later on, uh, later in this lecture. There is a timestamp request and reply. Timestamp request and timestamp reply messages can be used to calculate the round trip time between a source and a destination machine even if their clocks are not synchronized. So, sending time is equal to value of received timestamp minus value of original timestamp. So, this way you can uh, <coughs> get some idea about the uh, round trip time. There are other ways we will see. So, receiving time is the time the packet returned minus value of transmit time time. Round trip time is equal to sending time plus receiving time. So, the timestamp request and timestamp reply message can be used to synchronize two clocks in two machines if the exact one way time duration is known. Address mask request and reply enables a host to request and receive the network of subnet mask useful for disk stations at startup, but we have seen that DHCP is another way of handling this. Router solicitation and advertisement allows for request of routing information and the reply of this information. Routers can periodically send router advertisement without being solicited. So, uh, what happens is that suppose uh, a router has uh, just been connected to the network. Now, you remember uh, that routers have to um, uh, um, uh, run the routing protocol whether whatever it is say RIP or BGP or OSPF whatever it is. So, that route that means it needs to talk to its peers, it needs to talk to the other routers. Now, uh, but how will the other routers know that a new guy has uh, in the block that means the new router has been connected to the network. So, one way is that as soon as the router gets connected it does some router uh, solicitation and advertisement. It advertises itself ok, I am here, I am here. So, that other people get to know that he is here and slowly the entire network uh, becomes aware of this new router uh, which is connected ok. And similarly, say a link may go down and all kinds of other things may happen. So, this router uh, exchange of router information that has to happen through some mechanism. So, this is one. Router discovery message, host can learn about available gateways to other networks. Host send a router solicitation message to begin the process using the multicast address of 224.0.0.2 as the destination. May also be a broadcast message in case a router does not accept multicast messages. When a router receives the message, it will advertise its available gateway. And finally, the checksum of the ICMP message. In ICMP, the checksum is calculated over the entire message that is the header and data combined. This is just to keep some control over errors. Clock synchronization. Software may require time synchronization. Uh, so, ICMP timestamp message combat this problem as we have already discussed allows local host to ask for current time from remote host using ICMP timestamp request. So, type 13 and then remote host uses ICMP timestamp reply which is type 14. So, better way of synchronizing clock may be to use network time protocol that is a different thing we are not discussing it here and the time is the UT the universal time. Now, a little bit more about uh, ping and trace route. Uh, these, so as an overview, I mean, and of course, this is a part of the ICMP messages, but since these are so useful, uh, I thought that I will just discuss it uh, specially a little bit. So, ping sends an ICMP message to a remote host and lets you determine if that host is responding. Actually, ping uses that 
echo uh, and echo reply uh, for this the, that ICMP message. And trace route uses TTL fields to query all hosts en route to a specific destination. You can use trace route to map a network. Uh, um, that means you want to know which is the route you are tracing. I'm coming to it. Now let's first uh, talk about ping. It is uh, named after sonar. You know, in uh, sonar you want to probe some place, so you send an ultra uh, sound um, signal, just like you do in a radar. And if it bounces off something, you get a ping. Uh, okay, so that is where the name comes from. So you want uh, you send an echo request and you expect an echo reply that is your ping. So, server normally implemented in kernel uses ICMP echo and echo reply messages. On Unix, the identifier field is set to Unix PID of sending process. Sequence number starts at 0, incremented every time a new echo message is sent. Actually, what happens is that usually, I mean of course, you can configure it that uh, when you uh, do a, when you ping a machine, not just one request is sent, uh, because think about it this way, um, the machine you are trying to pin, uh, that channel uh, may be noisy. Okay. If, if that happens, uh, your echo request or the reply may um, get dropped in between. So, sending one uh, request uh, is uh, was not thought sufficient, so maybe three times or five times you can um, sort of configure it. It sends echo request and it expects all the three or all the five replies. May, maybe it re re receives none of them. Okay. So, in that case it will say that okay, 100 percent packet loss or it will, it will just uh, get maybe uh, 2 out of 5. So, it will say 60 percent packet loss and 40 percent and this is the time. I will show you uh, one example of a ping. Suppose uh, we have a ping the machine 144.16.192.182.1. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, we have uh, ping this machine. Mm, I simply say ping and then give the uh, IP address over here. By the way, you could also use a, if you have a name server on the network, you could also put a name over there. Anyway, ping 144.16.182.1, uh, uh, 56 data bytes, that is your data plus it will have something, we will come to that calculation later on. So, you may get uh, a result something like this, 64 bytes from, <coughs> so this is the, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean this is what you are getting from the echo. Uh, eco reply. So, 64 bytes from uh, 144 uh, six, uh, 16 182 1 uh, uh, ICMP sequence equal to 0, time to leave is 240 and time is equal to 37 milliseconds. So, it gives you some idea about um, how much time it takes, I will come to that. So, then another packet has come back as an echo reply. 64 bytes from the same machine, uh, sequence number 1 and time is so much, so much. And at the end of all this, so, so for each packet that it receives back as a reply, it is going to uh, print a line like this. And then finally, it will give you a statistics, maybe it will something like this, it is a 13 packets transmitted, 11 packets received, which means that it had originally sent 13 packets and it got only 11 packets back. Uh, so, 2 packets must have got lost. Okay. So, 15 percent packet loss and uh, round trip time you may the mean average max. Uh, so, maybe it can you so from the ping you can get an idea about the uh, round trip time. So, this is uh, one uh, the answer and some details on the output sequence number is shown for each message. In our example, message returned in order, but we lost some packets. The may return may be out of order also. TTL field of return message is uh, displayed and round trip time is calculated at the host based on the sequence number. So, we can estimate the bandwidth also, not only the round trip time, uh, we can try to use for that means, of course, this works only for a few hops. Okay. If it is beyond a number of hops, your ping will not work. But anyway, the ping packet, um, so it can estimate the bandwidth, 20 byte IP header, let us say oh, what is the total, 
So, 20 byte IP header, 8 byte ICMP header, 56 byte message. This can be set by the user. So, total datagram size is that. Uh, so, 76 plus 8 that is 84 bytes. So, 84 bytes was sent. Now, PPP suppose it was sent through a PPP, so it will add about 8 bytes for total size of 92 bytes. So, this connection looks like, uh, so 92 divided by 0 0.180 uh, by 2 that is about 1069 bytes per second. What is this 0 0.180? So, uh, if you So, so, so this is so, so 92 bytes. So, this is maybe uh, time all right. So, this gives you some idea about what kind of uh, bandwidth you are having and uh, maybe as you can see then this particular case the bandwidth is not uh, that much. So, only about 1069 bytes per second all right. So, you may do it and uh, this is a very crude estimate, but you can get some kind of feel about uh, the your immediate uh, locality. Now, there is a record route option. Most ping implementations provide record route, uh, which is uh, say minus r option on uh, minus capital R option on Unix, Linux and uh, minus small r option on Windows. Each router stores its address in the IP options field. Only 9 addresses are possible. Thus, round trip record only 9 possible. Uh, and, uh, only possible for four routing hops. So, you can take only four hops and in, uh, but within that time, uh, within that four hops, you can find out that how your message went and how it came back. Okay, maybe it went and came back through different paths, it could be or maybe it took the same path, etcetera. You can actually trace uh, the route. Of course, as you see that because of the limitation on the size that is because on the number of addresses that you can store, uh, you can only uh, route or map the network in your immediate locality. So, if you want to go beyond this, then you have to uh, use something else and we will come to that, that is trace route. So, trace route uses a sequence of ICMP messages to determine the current route to a particular uh, destination. Uh, so, how, uh, so this is actually uh, done in an iterative fashion. So, what, uh, what I will do is that suppose I want to trace route to uh, a distant machine, I know it is IP address. So, what I am going to do is that I am going to um, give, uh, I mean send a message to that machine, but maybe uh, put a very small um, number for the time to leave. So, what is going to happen is that uh, my message will take so many hops and then it is time to leave, it has not reached the destination. So, it is somewhere, uh, I mean it has just started maybe towards the beginning. So, its time to leave is going to become 0. So, as soon as the time to leave uh, becomes 0, the intermediate node may be that router. So, what it will do is it will have to drop the packet and it sends, if you remember, it sends an ICMP message back to the source. So, now my uh, program catches this ICMP message and on ok, that was on the way. So, it now uh, sends maybe the same uh, dummy message to the destination after uh, increasing the time to leave by one unit. So, now it is going to get past that router which had uh, in the previous instance uh, dropped the packet. So, it will give, go one more hop and then the packet will get dropped. So, that router is now going to send an ICMP message back to the source. So, we will know that okay, after this router that is the router which had uh, I mean that is on the way. So, in this way one by one iteratively you keep on increasing uh, the time to leave and that way you route the I mean trace the entire route, you map it out. But one small question, what happens when it reaches the destination? Well, uh, when it reaches the destination at that point what is done is that this message is sent to a, uh, a very uh, unlikely port, a very randomly selected unlikely port. So, most probably the 
destination machine will not know uh, about this port. So, it will say that port is unreachable and then that ICMP message will come back and we know that I have reached my destination. So, this way one by one I have traced the entire route from the source to the destination. So, this is how it works trace route uses a sequence of ICMP messages to determine the current route to a particular destination. The TTL specifies the number of hops a message can travel. Trace route sends UDP datagrams while varying the TTL. The router that drops the UDP packet replies with a time exceeded ICMP message. The endpoint won't reply with that ICMP message because it has already reached the end. So trace route sends to an unlikely UDP port. Eventually, get a no such port ICMP message. Uh, <coughs> it knows that it's uh, reached the end. So, and you can see about the ICMP messages. So this is the uh, reference. Actually. Uh, these protocols uh, in um, internet control message protocols, there are a, a number of others which we did not discuss, we just discussed a few of them. And then uh, there are some uh, protocol like uh, DHCP, boot P, RARP, ARP, these are also uh, there uh, in, the, in the stack as you will find out. For example, ARP, uh, we talked about this, uh, they help in running the network um, in, a, uh, in a better fashion. So, we have ARP protocol which is a low level protocol, we have this RARP, boot P, ICMP, uh, RARP, boot P and DHCP uh, that is for assigning a networks. Then is ICMP which helps in uh, controlling uh, the network operation and giving error messages. And then there is another side protocol which we will uh, discuss in the next class namely IGMP which is for internet group management protocol. So, that is another part of routing that we have not uh, discussed as yet. So, uh, we will uh, take it up in the next class. Good day. So, today we will take up two topics uh, DNS and directory. So, first let us talk about DNS. The DNS is uh, the um, short form for domain name system. Okay. Now, so uh, we have seen uh, uh, two kinds of addresses till now. One is that we have seen uh, MAC addresses or the so called hardware addresses in case of ethernet they are also called ethernet addresses uh, <coughs> which is used in the data link layer for direct communication. Then we have seen IP addresses which are used for uh, communication between two endpoints all right uh, two endpoints in the um, network. So, they may be anywhere in the network. So, uh, IP address includes information used for routing. So, IP address is what is used for routing there is a network part and host part etcetera. Okay. But then unfortunately these IP addresses are tough for humans to remember. You can remember only a few addresses and which you basically require for your uh, own configuration etcetera. Maybe you will need to know your own IP address, your address of your gateway etcetera etcetera. But then uh, maybe also address of your uh, for your uh, mail server. But then beyond that if you have to remember IP addresses of other people it becomes very difficult for human beings to remember this okay. they are, and of course they are impossible to guess. But then uh, what humans uh, find it much easier to remember and use are the uh, domain names so are the names for example if, um, and the domain names I mean you must have come across these domain names. Uh, because uh, that is what people uh, most of the time that is what people use in uh, surfing the web. And uh, for a www site sometimes you can see that you may not maybe you do not know the name exactly, uh, but uh, you make out 3-4 guesses 
maybe make some combination dot com dot net etc on this side and this side something which looks maybe intel uh, and this thing. So, I will try intel dot com first thing okay maybe if it does not work maybe I will try a few other things. So, we can guess. So, and not only we can guess the other thing is that the most important thing is that it is uh, much easier to remember. So, we need remember so many uh, site names. So, it is easier for humans to remember. So, for this human interface we need and so, this is once again what is the name after all it is supposed to map to some particular uh, machine or site or whatever all right. So, this is also in some sense this is also some kind of an address. So, we have a third layer which is this uh, which are the domain names. So, today we will see how the uh, how we use uh, these domain names and of course, uh, just as a, uh, in the local area network uh, you require a mapping from uh, IP addresses to MAC addresses that is done by the ARP protocol and the reverse MAC address to IP address RARP. Similarly, here you need a mechanism for mapping the domain names to IP addresses. So, we have uh, discussed this why not centralized DNS single point of failure traffic volume distance centralized database would not work, maintenance would be a problem, it does not scale. So, new server, so it is distributed, no server has all the name to IP address mapping. Local name servers, each ISP company has local name uh, and uh, or the default name server and host query first goes to the local name server. Authoritative name server, this you might come across sometimes that something is being given by authoritative name server. For a host towards uh, that host's IP address names can perform name address translation for that host's name. So, uh, and anyway there are some uh, more things up the hierarchy. And there is there are some root name servers ok. Uh, so, the root name server can uh, so they are actually as I said that centric and some of the biggest uh, name servers root name servers are uh, in all in USA, um, but, but of course, there um, I mean that depends on what root it is. Uh, so, they are uh, that's, uh, they could be distributed also. NS lookup, NS lookup is an interactive resolver that allows the user to communicate directly with a DNS server. So, uh, from the OS you can use this NS lookup and uh, give a name query. So, this is actually um, uh, name server lookup that is how the term M NS lookup comes. NS lookup is usually available on Unix workstations. So, servers handle requests for their domain directly. So, the, uh, we are now let us talk about the servers and servers handle requests for other domains by contacting remote DNS servers and servers cache external mappings. If a server has no clue about where to find the address for a host name, it asks the root server. The root server will tell you what name server to contact. A request may get forwarded a few times. For, uh, for example, uh, 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 let us say, uh, say the IIT KGP and, uh, has a name server all right. Now, if the IIT KGP has a name server and a request for a, a particular domain name translation has come to it, uh, it does not know the name server to whom to connect. So, it can always uh, uh, transfer it to uh, the next higher level namely uh, ERNet. And if the ERNet also does not know where in this in it is there, then it can uh, contact the in. In will definitely know all the uh, uh, all the subdomains under it, it has to know it because it is administering that domain. Similarly, if it is for some uh, address which is from outside, you can send it directly to the root of that particular uh, domain. Say, suppose from India you are trying to contact something for Japan. So, you can uh, send it to the um, JP root name server and then JP root name server would know uh, which name server to contact. So, that will come back. So, this way DNS queries will go back and forth a few times and finally, the name will be resolved. 
Now we come to LDAP which is the lightweight directory access protocol. <laughs> Actually like uh, since uh, this was uh, designed by the same uh, people who design OSI. So, this x.500 actually tends to be a little complex all right. So, complex it is heavy uh, and it uses the OSI layer all the seven layers. Now, for the internet people uh, internet purpose actually uh, which uses the TCP IP stack rather than the seven layer OSI stack uh, there was a uh, lightweight directory access protocol which can uh, interoperate with this x at least on one side that LDAP can use that x.500 directory service, but this is much simpler than x.500 and LDAP is used in many places. So, this is a lightweight directory access protocol supports x.500 interface does not require the OS, uh, OSI protocol this uses a TCP IP protocol. So, this is x.500 for the internet crowd useful as a generic addressing interface uh, like Netscape address book and so on. The LDAP or lightweight directory access protocol is a networking protocol for querying and modifying directory services running over TCP IP and LDAP directory usually follows the same x.500 model which we have discussed. Now, it is a tree of entries we each of which consists a set of named attributes uh, with values and LDAP directory often reflects various political geographic and or organizational boundaries depending on the model chosen. And uh, when you do that you can also define your uh, security policies based on this uh, directory and based on this uh, boundary. So, you can do that authentication service specially. So, a directory is a tree of directory entries that we have seen an entry consists of a set of attributes and attribute value pairs and the attributes are defined in a schema. So, this is the so this would be the uh, protocol stack uh, for LDAP. So, you have a directory based application ok may be some authorization service or may be some access to some um, some information which may be there for the organization which uses LDAP. LDAP may use TLS, this TLS is transport level uh, security. So, uh, transport level security actually you could use SSL also, actually I am talking a lot of a uh, lot about security here, uh, we have not discussed security. So, we will in future we will uh, sort of um, give one lecture to security because this has become so important. Now, in an organizational context uh, a directory may be an important component of the entire security arrangement. Security is a complex issue, but anyway for this uh, uh, LDAP we uh, require uh, that we communicate securely in many cases and many uh, LDAP implementations. Uh, support this start TLS uh, that is a transport level security or you can use SSL also um, or SSL. Uh, 